Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to ESPN, the magazine. <laughs> oh, wait a second. This is CSIS, the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I know it's... Uh, <clears throat> my name is Andy Cutchins. I'm the director of the Russia Eurasia program. And uh, welcome to our version of Friday Morning Live. Um, we're going to be discussing the Sochi Olympics, domestic, regional, and security challenges. And I apologize for the late start. I am completely responsible for the late start. And let me just say for the record, it is not cool to be late to your own event, OK? I don't condone this kind of behavior. And I think later on in the day, I will be tarred and feathered right outside of the building on 1616 Rhode Island Avenue here in the center of Washington, DC. All right, um, brief introduction. This is the first time that the Center for Strategic and National Studies has actually published a report about an Olympic Games. This is done by our uh, uh, former visiting scholar, Sergei Markadonov, a uh, brilliant analyst of uh, Asians, uh, of Caucasian affairs and security issues. Uh, Islam, extremism, extremism, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and it's got a really cool cover, I think. Um, terrific report, for my money, the best, uh, the best thing you can read about some of the challenges and issues around these games. Uh, so that's one unique aspect about these, about these games. Never before has uh, a Winter Olympic Games been held in a subtropical climate. The fact that the subtropical climate happens to be in the country that actually occupies the most territory in the Arctic, in the Arctic region is uh, rather anomalous as well. Never before has an Olympic Games been held in a region in such close, close proximity to a conflict zone. Uh, never bef and a little bit more about this conflict zone, never before has an Olympic Games be been held in a conflict in such cl close proximity to a conflict zone in which was, in fact, uh, the site of effectively two civil wars in the country that, was, that is holding the games, one of which effectively Russia lost in the mid-1990s to with Chechnya, and one of which was won. Uh, uh, the, the zone, the Northern Caucasus that I'm referring to, uh, where my uh, uh, col esteemed colleagues will talk at greater length uh, about the challenges, challenges there, you know, when Mr. Putin went down to Guatemala City in, in 2007, it was a period of relative, relative quiescence, I would say, in the area. The Chechnya had been somewhat, had been somewhat stabilized. And the, uh, the frequency of violence in the other republics uh, in the North Caucasus had not begun to escalate, perhaps, to the degree that it did shortly thereafter. Nevertheless, it was a very, very risky decision, I think, for the International Olymp Olympic Committee to do so. Never before, more on the conflict zone, never before has an Olympic Games been held in even closer proximity to a country which the host country fought a war with after the Olympic Committee awarded Russia the Games. I'm referring, of course, to the Russia-Georgian War. Sochi, depending on where you are in Sochi, is 10, 15 kilometers away from Abkhazia, uh, the region of Georgia, uh, which the Russian Federation acknowledged as independent after the August 2008 war. Another pretty unique aspect about these games. Never before in my lifetime, my lifetime, I was born on February 13th, 1959, just be clear about this, never before in my lifetime has an Olympic Games <clears throat> been so politically controversial and so identified with the leader of the host country, that of course being Vladimir Putin. Um, so no, we're not going to talk today about the uh, well, let me just say one more thing, because we are in Washington, D.C., and I don't think ever before has a sports icon from Washington, D.C. been so closely associated with the foreign host, the leader of the country, 
Vladimir Putin, of these games. Obviously, I'm talking about OV, Alexander Ovechkin, who will be uh, captaining the Russian hockey team and is a FOP, friend of Putin. Very close friend, I believe. So an interesting aspect from the Washington, D.C. angle. Um, <clears throat> so I've already said, uh, said, said too much because we have a really terrific uh, uh, set of panelists uh, in which uh, I will give brief introductions for all of them uh, in the order in which they speak. Uh, the first speaker will be Jeffrey Mankoff to my left, who is Deputy Director and Fellow here at CSIS at the Russia and Eurasia, Eurasia Program. Uh, speaking uh, after uh, Jeff will be Gordon Hahn, uh, analyst and advisory board member of the Geostrategic Forecasting Corporation. And uh, Gordon has been a, uh, a visiting uh, fellow here at CSIS. And I uh, would point to, in particular, a report that he wrote about getting uh, the Caucasus Emirate right. Uh, and he is uh, one of the world's leading authorities on the extremist groups terrorist groups, individuals uh, who are, in fact, threatening these games. Uh, Gordon has a new book coming out very shortly. Gordon, the title of the book is, yes, The Caucasus Emirate Mujahideen, Global Jihadism in Russia's North Caucasus and Beyond. Uh, you know, it would have been good for your publishers to think a little bit more about marketing and have this book out. <laughs> be before, the, before the games, but, but, so, but so be it. Uh, uh, he'll be speaking uh, next and, uh, and focusing on that, on that topic. Uh, Jeff is going to kind of focus more, I think, on really the Russia angle and what these games mean for Russia, what they mean for Putin, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and that angle. And I'm very, very pleased uh, to uh, and happy to welcome uh, from uh, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, uh, Tom DeWall, who's a senior associate there, and one of the world's leading authorities on the Caucasus more broadly. And Tom also has a uh, reasonably new book out uh, that, da, da, da. okay, sorry, sorry C-SPAN. Tom, where's, what, why in your bio isn't the name of your newest book a little easier to find? Give us the title. Actually, I just did a new version of my old book last year. I think that must be what you're thinking of. Um, the a new version of your old book. You've you, you got to work on the marketing a little <laughs> bit about that. I don't, you know. No, no. It's, of course, it's a, you'll have to read it. It's, got, it's my book about the, the Karabakh conflict came out in an in updated version last year. Okay. Uh, still, I didn't hear the title there, but. A Black Garden. Okay. Sorry. All right. So, and then finally, uh, batting cleanup uh, uh, for very, very good reasons uh, is our colleague uh, here at CSIS uh, in the Transnational Threat Program, uh, Senior Advisor Juan Zarate. Uh, and Juan uh, is going to be talking, I think, more about kind of the broader terrorist threat and it, in particular, you know, what, how the U.S. is looking at this. And he'll be speaking from his direct uh, experience. Uh, and serving in, uh, uh, in the Bush administration with responsibilities for monitoring and dealing with these kinds of, kinds of threats. So uh, thank you very much uh, for being here this morning. And let me turn the floor over to Jeff. OK, thank you. And thanks to all of you for coming out this morning. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the decision to hold the Olympics in Sochi, the role of Putin, and the significance of the games for Putin and for the Russian political elite more broadly. As Andy alluded to, the decision to hold the Olympics in a city like Sochi was a fairly extraordinary one. Uh, this is one of the few cities in Russia that doesn't actually have a serious continental climate. Uh, it's incredible that they're actually worried there may not be snow uh, at the ski resorts and are stockpiling it. So given all that, given the proximity to the conflict zones, given the 
the weather challenges, why on earth would you hold the Olympics in Sochi? Um, and here I think it comes back in a lot of ways to the personality of Vladimir Putin and to the Russian political elite uh, more broadly. Sochi has been a kind of summer capital uh, for the Russian elite going back at least to the Soviet period. This was a resort town where a lot of the elite had uh, dachas where they would take their families in the summer to go to the beaches uh, where Putin and a number of his close associates uh, also own property. Um, and as far as the proximity to the Caucasus, I think there's an important note here uh, as well. Um, you have to remember that the instability that we see just down the road from Sochi today was very different from how that region looked in 2007 when the games were awarded. At that point, uh, the second war in Chechnya had largely ground to a close and the wider insurgency across the North Caucasus hadn't really uh, taken off yet. So it was a moment when it looked like this area was being stabilized when the worst of the excesses of the previous decade uh, had finally come to an end. And so for that reason, I think there was an important element of trying to use the Olympics as a way of showing that stability had returned to this region uh, and more broadly using it as an avenue for uh, economic development that would then lay a foundation for a more durable uh, version of stability to, to break out across the wider region. Now, of course, Russia and the Caucasus in 2007, I think, looked a lot better uh, than they do today. In a lot of ways, the Sochi Games look kind of like a Soviet era, uh, not only prestige project, but also something on the, this idea of megalomania uh, that we often associate with uh, Soviet infrastructure projects, like the, the railroads or the, the, the dams or the reversal of rivers that was being contemplated at one point for Siberia. This was a very top-down operation. It was uh, an opportunity to channel vast sums of money uh, into construction of new venues, uh, it was an opportunity for large amounts of that money then to be siphoned off. Um, at the same time, though, because so much emphasis is, is being placed on this, because so much of the prestige of Putin and the broader elite is tied up in it, there's been a lot of attention to what's actually going on uh, inside Sochi. And actually, the picture has been uh, not a particularly pretty one. Uh, if you look at the results um, of what's happened so far, I think the, the idea that Putin wanted to convey when he went to Guatemala City in 2007, that Russia was back, that stability has returned uh, to the North Caucasus, those, um, those boasts, I suppose, are increasingly being called into question. I'll leave uh, my colleagues to talk about the security challenges, but I want to focus for a moment on um, the corruption and on the broader political context, which I think is also undermining the, the message that Putin is trying to get across about uh, what these games mean for Russia. Now, when Putin went to Guatemala City, he said that Russia would spend $12 billion on running these, on uh, preparing for these Olympics. Already that would make them the most expensive winter games uh, in history. The actual figure, it looks like, is going to be above $50 billion. Uh, somewhere around $51 billion was the figure that um, was disclosed by the anti-corruption blogger Alexei Navalny and which has been batted around uh, in the media. Now, in part, that is unsurprising because of the lack of infrastructure, the need to actually build up new venues to build transportation corridors uh, to actually put the things in place that you're going to need uh, for the Olympics. But at the same time, um, Navalny estimated that at least a third of that money was just outright stolen. Uh, and again, in that sense, it's a very Russian story. Um, one of the m more uh, piquant um, uh, instances coming out of all of this is the story of the construction of the road between Sochi uh, and Adler. It's a very short road. I don't remember the exact length. I think it's like 30 kilometers. Um, the cost of building it was estimated to be $8.7 billion. Uh, as one journalist pointed out, for that you could pave the entire road in caviar. Um, now, most of the funding for this and all of the other uh, projects that are connected with the Olympics are coming from public coffers in one way or another. Um, the government keeps emphasizing that, no, actually a lot of this is private. Uh, some of the oligarchs are being asked uh, out of their own pockets to pay for different kinds of, uh, of Olympic venues, different kinds of construction projects. And that's true, but at the same time, um, this investment is being underwritten by uh, loan guarantees from public banks, uh, such as Venetia 
chicken en banc, uh, which means that ultimately at the end of the day, it's going to be the taxpayers who are on the hook. Very few, if any of these projects, actually look like they're going to make money. Uh, at the same time, Olympic construction has been a huge boon for organized crime, uh, resulting in kickbacks, bribes, shakedowns, the whole litany of uh, activities that one would expect from uh, the Russian underworld. Now, given all of this, given the heightened attention to the security challenges uh, and the fact that Russia faces a whole host of broader difficulties that have been uh, spreading over the last couple of years, I think it's unsurprising that uh, there doesn't seem to be a lot of enthusiasm inside Russia or out for uh, holding these Olympics. Um, we had a, a speaker come here about a week ago who's a, a leading Russian opposition politician, and we, we were discussing this, and he said, you know, he remembered the contrast, or he was pointing out the contrast between the attitudes in Russia today and the attitudes in Moscow in 1980 when uh, the summer games were being held in, in the Soviet Union for the first time. He said in 1980 there was a palpable sense that everybody was in this together, that there was a sense of pride that the Soviet Union was going to be hosting the Olympics, uh, and a sense of almost defiance that the outside world was choosing to boycott it over the invasion of Afghanistan. And he said, today, there's much more apathy. There's much less interest. People just don't care. They're aware of the corruption. They're aware that none of this is actually going to benefit them once the Olympics are over. And they question all of the expenditures that are being uh, put into it. And of course, they're worried about uh, security. It seems, uh, according to the most recent estimates I've seen, that only about 70 percent of the tickets uh, have been sold for most of the Olympic events, which, given that we're a week out from the opening ceremonies, is a pretty uh, extraordinary vote of no confidence. At the same time, holding the Olympics in Russia and holding the Olympics in Sochi has really put Russia and Putin in the global media spotlight at a time when the country, I think, is facing uh, a number of challenges. And that global spotlight has really emphasized uh, where Russia is, seems to be going off track, a lot of the, the problems that are accumulating uh, in that country. There's obviously a lot of global media attention now on Russia's uh, gay rights challenges. And I don't think it's surprising that uh, the U.S. delegation is going to be headed by Billie Jean King. Uh, if you haven't seen them, look at the uniforms for the German team that's going to be participating uh, in the Olympics. They're rainbow flags. Um, it's, it's become an opportunity for the outside world, which is increasingly frustrated with Putin's Russia, to make a point, uh, to make points about all of the things um, that they're struggling with. Now, I think the government recognized some of the problems and in the run-up to the Olympics tried to take uh, some limited steps to uh, address what they expected would be um, the most salient sources of complaint. So uh, Russia's most prominent political prisoner, Mikhail Khodorkovsky, was released uh, shortly before the Olympics. Uh, the punk band Pussy Riot was released. Uh, and in part, this seems to be an effort on the part of the authorities to put things uh, in a good light before the global media, to change the narrative. Uh, ahead of these Olympics. But I don't think that they've succeeded. Uh, I think if you look at the list of who's not going to the opening ceremonies among uh, international leaders, that probably, I think that does actually say a lot about uh, how the rest of the world views these games and views current political developments in Russia. Um, President Obama's not going. Vice President Biden's not going. Angela Merkel's not going. Francois Hollande is not going. Um, Shinzo Abe and Xi Jinping are. Uh, and that is an interesting commentary in and of itself, I suppose. Um, so as far as shaping the narrative for an international audience, I think it's hard to say that, so far at least, the Olympics have been a success. And if there's a problem with one of the venues that fails, if there's a terrorist attack, then I think that narrative is only going to get more negative. But at the end of the day, I think it's important to remember who the main audience is. Yes, it's important, I think, for Putin to emphasize to the international community that Russia is back, that Russia can hold an event on the scale of these games. But the most important audience is domestic. Uh, how this plays in Russia, I think, is in a lot of ways more important. Uh, 
Uh, and so far, you know, I think we haven't seen uh, an upsurge of enthusiasm. Now, if the Russian team does really well, if they win a lot of gold medals, if the Olympics go off without a hitch, then maybe once the games are over, after the closing ceremonies have happened, we'll revise how we evaluate them. But I think right now, it's a very uh, questionable proposition to think that these Olympics are actually going to function in the way that Putin and the Russian elite intended them to function when Putin went to Guatemala City in 2007 and was actually given the right to host the Olympics this year. Thank you very, thank you very much, Jeff. Very comprehensive and, and, and trenchant. I uh, might also uh, note that uh, Lindsey Vaughn is not going, although I don't believe that's a political statement. You know, the, the budget for these games, it kind of reminds me of the, uh, uh, the, the question of trying to uh, estimate what the Soviet military budget was. Nobody knows. I don't think anybody knows what it, what it is. Uh, and I don't think we're ever gonna we're ever gonna find out. Um, thanks. Let me turn to uh, uh, to Gordon. Okay, picking up briefly where Jeff uh, left off, I think this is uh, potentially a very important turning point in post-Soviet Russian history, depending on the outcome of the games. Uh, we're very likely likely to see if we see some kind of catastrophic uh, terrorist attack. Um, a complete reversal of what has been left of the, what I consider to have been a, a liberalization or a thaw under uh, President uh, Medvedev, and an even more sharp turn to more hardline policies uh, under Putin. So it's a very important moment. And, and a turn to a more hardline would be based on the post Peslan model when we saw the major attack in, in Peslan and a hard turn uh, clamping down and a rolling back of uh, democracy in Russia. Okay, to the threat. Um, about six, seven months ago, I wrote a paper for the Geostrategic Forecast Forecasting Corporation on the Sochi threat, and I outlined six different features that I thought uh, uh, were important. First, um, or, and I I'm here, I'm talking about potential perpetrators within the Caucasus Emirate Mujahideen, potential tactics and uh, targets. Uh, first is uh, suicide bombings run by the Dagestani network of the Caucasus Emirate Mujahideen, the so-called Dagestan Vilayat which could be either Dagestani locals or ethnic Russians uh, converts to Islam, which the Dagestan Vilayat has specialized in uh, recruiting and deploying for uh, suicide bombings. Uh, attacks perpetrated by a uh, foreign group independently or in league with the Caucasus Emirate Mujahideen, uh, a possible chemical attack uh, involving groups from the Caucasus Emirate who have returned from Syria and may have acquired uh, chemical weapons. There are also two attempts inside Russia this year that appeared to be focused on perhaps targeting chemical weapons. Um, suicide bombings run by uh, Caucasus Emirate Amir uh, Doku Abu Usman Umarov uh, and the Riyadh Salakin Martyrs Brigade, which he revived, um, Umarov revived in 2009. Uh, and there have been, since the formation of the Caucasus Emirate, 54 suicide bombings carried out since October 2007 in Russia, so about nine per year. Um, uh, and finally, um, or next to last, uh, attacks possibly involving Cherkassian elements, that is Kabardine, ethnic Kabardine, ethnic uh, Adig, Adige, or uh, ethnic um, uh, Cherkass, uh, since given the uh, location of the Olympics and the uh, massacre that occurred uh, uh, in the late 19th uh, century of uh, Cherkassians on Krasnaya Polyana. There's an interest in the Cherkassian Mujahideen to uh, participate. Uh, so there's a wing in the, on the, in the Caucasus Emirate of Cherkassian uh, Emirate who might want to take uh, part. And then second is attacks on targets other than Sochi. That is, uh, it wouldn't take um, uh, a major attack uh, in Moscow or coordinated attacks, say, in each of the Vilayats under the Emirat, uh, the Caucasus Emirates uh, uh, base of operations uh, in the North Caucasus, attack in St. Petersburg, some kind of a major attack or event would be enough, I think, to help spoil the Olympics. Uh, so let me look at each of those uh, briefly in turn in more detail. Um, the Dagestan Vilayat threat, the, the, uh, using um, uh, uh, local Dagestani suicide bombers, or ethnic Russian suicide uh, bombers. This largely comes from a group led by a guy by the name of Abu Muhammad uh, Rustam Asadarov, is his real name. He is the emir of the Dagestan Vilayat. 
uh, and the um, Qadi of the Sharia court of the Dagestan Viliyad, man by the name of Sheikh Muhammad Abu Usman al Gimravi, born Magomed Suleimanov. And also the head of the central sector of the Dagestan Viliyad, man by the name of Abu Tahir Qadari. And in the central sector, uh, there are two key uh, subsectors. One is the Mahachkala sector uh, and the Bunaksk Jamaat. Now, the Bunaksh Jamaat turns out to have been the place where, the, uh, at least according to the, na the National Anti-Terrorist Committee uh, report yesterday, that the two suicide bombing bombers who attacked Volgograd on December 29th and December 30th were from the Bunaksh Jamaat, uh, Oskar Samedov and uh, Sule Suleiman Magomedov. Uh, the Bunaksh Jamaat apparently has uh, several Jamaats under it, and one of those Jamaats is an ethnic Russian Jamaat. Um, previously, there were, there, previously, there were reports about a group called the Muva, Muva Hadun uh, Al Rusi, and that group may have been involved uh, in some of these attacks that I'm going to mention. The Dagestan Vilayat has used r ethnic Russian converts uh, in suicide bombings uh, on 14 February 2011 in Gubded, Dagestan. Uh, a colleague of theirs, Viktor Dorkovsky, was apprehended by Russian forces, but not before he detonated a grenade and blew off his hand. He was also a suicide, a would-be suicide bomber. The August 12th uh, assassination of the most popular Sufi sheikh in Dagestan uh, was uh, carried out by a female ethnic Russian convert, and his, her handler was uh, uh, ethnic Russian mujahideh, mujahid by the name of Dmitry Sokolov. He was also the person who organized the October suicide bombing in Volgograd in, Octo uh, in October. Uh, he was killed about a week after that attack. Uh, the emir of that group then became a guy by the name of Alexei Pashintsev. And when the December 29th attack occurred in Volgograd, there were reports that a, a Pavel Pechonkin had been the perpetrator of the suicide bombing. Uh, he's also, also an ethnic Russian convert who was part of this uh, Bunaksk uh, Jamaat, the Russian Jamaat under the Bunaksk Jamaat. And there are several others. Uh, uh, on January 19th, 19th, there was a videotape uh, on the Dagestan Vilayat website of two, two uh, Mujahideen claiming to be from the Ansar al uh, Sunnah group. Um, they identified themselves as Suleiman and Abdurrahman. Uh, so one of those names, Suleiman, corresponds with the National Anti-Terrorist uh, Committee's claim of uh, an, uh, a, a Suleiman uh, Magomedov, having taken... Uh, the Pinchonkin was not involved, which means that the ethnic Russians, the ethnic Russian Mujahideen, are still out there and uh, may still be heard from. In fact, the Dagestan Vilayat has been publishing all sorts of recent uh, material encouraging Russians to rise up and talking about the ethnic Russian Mujahideen. Uh, one of the key factors uh, of the, um, the Ansar al Sunnah. Announced there were two announcements that one has gotten a lot of press play and that is the videotape by the two Mujahideen I just mentioned the day before There was a text announcement by um, uh, The emir of this group and he threatened a chemical weapons attack and said that a, a Order was on the table of Omar uh, Amir uh, Omarov ready to be signed and if Russian troops hadn't withdrawn by the time of the, by, by the time of the Olympics there would be a, a tax up to and including chemical attacks is a direct quote. Um, the other potential here is the uh, potential of a foreign group joining in league with the Caucasus Emirate. And here, uh, and there's a tie in here with the possible, possibility of a chemical weapons attack, and that is that there are hundreds of Caucasus Emirate Mujahideen, and there are hundreds of would be replacements uh, to cover the attrition that occurs amongst the Caucasus uh, Emirate Mujahideen fighting in Syria. Some of those people could have got their hands on uh, sarin or other uh, sarin or other um, uh, chemical weapons, and there have been reports of people uh, coming, trying to come into Turkey with uh, sarin elements. And there was a report published uh, 
by Seymour Hersh, a journalist who claimed that CIA had been re reporting in spring to the Obama administration that um, the rebels had chemical weapons. And um, so there is a possibility that the rebels, in fact, do have weapons. Now, there are two groups of North Caucasus Mujahideen fighting in Syria. One is the Jund al Halafat, which is fighting under Jabhat al Nusra, and the other is the uh, Jaish uh, Mujahideen of Ansar. And uh, the emir of that group, or former emir of that group, is now the, emir, the military emir of the Northern Front of the ISIS, the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. And in fact, he is now attending shuras. So he's a high-ranking figure. So the possibility that Al-Qaeda and, or, or ISIS and Al-Qaeda and the Caucasus Emirate would team up to somehow get chemi chemical weapons into North Caucasus for an attack on uh, Sochi cannot be excluded. In terms of the Cherkassian th threat, uh, how much time I got? We've got a couple minutes. Um, the, the network of the Caucasus Emirate uh, uh, sub-network called the United Viliad of Kabardia, Balkaria, and Karachai, what I call the OVKBK, covers Kabardino, Balkaria, and Karachai, of Cherkessia. Those are Cherkassian, uh, par partially uh, Cherkassian populated groups. And they have a direct interest in taking part. Now, they, this network is much weaker than the Dagestani network, as is the Chechen network and as is the Ingushetti network. Uh, but it's the second most uh, powerful network. And it's possible that they would, as they would assign several Mujahideen to take part. But I doubt that they would be able to lead a major operation with the caveat that in February 2011, they carried out what looked like a practice run for an attack on Sochi. They car carried out a attack on the uh, Mount Elbrus Ski Resort District, uh, a multi-pronged attack in, involving destroying the uh, ski lift, a truck bomb in front of a hotel, killing four uh, Moscow uh, uh, tour tourists from Moscow, and several other small-scale attacks on, on police, s virtually simultaneously within a period of 48 hours, most of them within a 24-hour period. Uh, an alarm raised there in a connection with the foreign element is that uh, on January 13, the, uh, the Russian National Ter Anti-Terrorism Committee claimed that they had arrested uh, five terrorists who were part of, quote, an international terrorist organization, unquote, in kabardino balkaria and Nalchik, the capital of kabardino balkaria uh, <coughs> So there is a possibility of a Chukasian uh, operation, but I wouldn't expect it to be an operation to be led. Um, one uh, detail on the foreign element and the possibility of a chemi chemical attack uh, is that a fatwa was issued about a week before the video of the two Mujahideen, Mujahideen from Ansar al-Sunnah. And that fatwa was requested by the OVKBK, uh, Mujahideen, from the website, uh, the Sharia Committee, of one of the leading jihadi philosophers in the world, that is uh, Abu Muhammad Asim al-Maktasi. Uh, he's in prison, but his website and his Sharia committee apparently is working, and they issued a fatwa in which they justified the Volgograd suicide bombings, called for more, especially against Sochi, and then asked a group inside Russia uh, to make contact with the Caucasus Emirate and make sure that they coordinate with the Caucasus Emirate in carrying out any attacks. This could have been the Ansar al-Sunnah group, uh, and the fact that they put videos on the Dagestan Vilayet site was a signal that they had contacted uh, the Caucasus Emirate. Um, and then finally, in terms of uh, operations other than uh, attacking um, uh, Sochi, I won't talk about the Riyadh. I don't have time to talk about the Riyadh Salaki Martyrs Brigade. Maybe we can do that in, in questions. The Umarov appears to be, he could be running one of those four female suicide bombers, three of them who were from Dagestan, one who appears to be from Ingushetia. And he may be, he's very close to the Ingushetian Mujahideen and often is in Ingushetia, and he may be running that female suicide bomber. Uh, in terms of tactics, it's very likely that they would pick a target outside of Sochi. They would attack Moscow, they would attack uh, a major attack in Mahachkala, in Nalchik. They could try to assassinate one of the leaders of the North Caucasus. I expect that there'll be multiple teams, the Riyadh Salakin and Umarov, the Dagestani uh, Mujahideen, the ethnic Russian Mujahideen tied to the Dagestani um, Vilayat, uh, and perhaps the Cherkassian group um, being deployed simultaneously. And if all of them get through, so much the better as far as Umarov is concerned. If uh, uh, one or two of them get through or just one, well, that's uh, just the way the cookie crumbles. But uh, I'm not optimistic about avoiding a, at a minimum, I think we'll see a major uptick in jihadi activity during the games. And there's been a 
relative silence throughout January, which leads me to believe they're holding back resources. Uh, whether we'll see a catastrophic attack, unclear. Finally, the Caucasus Americans are very good at using various tactics. They're very determined. They're very resourceful. They're very innovative. So we have to be ready for really almost anything. With well, that, I'll close. <clears throat> thanks. Thanks, Gordon. That's a very sobering uh, <laughs> presentation. Um, but it is a, it is a reality. Uh, I mean, one of the other unique aspects of these games is I don't think we've mentioned that uh, Mdoku Umara, I mean, the, the leader of the Caucasus Emirate, whether he is dead or alive, uh, uh, he did directly threaten uh, the games back, back in July, effectively calling for those that are in his network or those and or those that uh, support uh, the ideology and goals that he is uh, 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 supporting to effectively kind of take off the handcuffs, civilians are fair game, everybody is, is, is fair game. Um, and my own personal view about Umara, I'm not sure whether at this point it matters very much whether he's actually dead or alive for the Sochi games themselves. Because uh, unlike, let's say, Shamil Basayev, uh, a probably the most infamous uh, and effective uh, terrorist from the North Caucasus over the course of the last two decades who was uh, killed in 2006, uh, finally. Uh, Basayev was very hands-on in actually carrying out operations. Umarov, uh, not, not, so, not, not so much. Now, certainly for the future of the Caucasus Emirate and or the movements after the Sochi Games, you know, whether he's dead or alive is going to, is going to matter. At any rate, uh, thanks very much, Gordon. That was uh, terrific. Uh, Tom, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Andy. Thank you for the invitation. It's great to be here. Um, I'm only regret is that uh, Sergei can't be with us and, and is in Moscow because he's written a, a, a great report. Um, I also want to pick you up on the two cheerful presentations of my of my uh, colleagues. Sort of take us back to July 2007 um, and a reminder that that was a point in which I think when the games were awarded to Sochi, this was a moment in which Vladimir Putin looked on these games with great ambition, um, that this would be a turning point for North Caucasus. This would be, I think he probably envisioned that this would be the moment when the world came back to the North Caucasus, dis um, discovered that the Caucasus wasn't as bad as, as the media portrayed it to be, um, that this was would be a kind of Putin-managed um, event of multiculturalism, um, Putin style, um, and that you know, it would be a kind of global event um, in which his, his vision of, of Russia and the Caucasus was vindicated. Unfortunately, as we know, that's um, not as it turned out to be. War broke out a year later um, uh, in Georgia. I think few would have predicted in July 2007 when the games were given to Sochi that that a year later, Russia would be recognizing um, the independence of Abkhazia. Um, so this wave of enthusiasm um, has obviously kind of fallen and, and, and risen again a bit. Um, I think there was, an, again, last year, uh, there was a bit more enthusiasm with the, the election of a new uh, government in Georgia, uh, the d d departure from the scene of uh, Mikhail Saakashvili, that, that this could be also an opportunity. Um, I remember the, the Georgian Foreign Minister, Maj Panjikidze, saying to me um, just about a month after or so after, after they came into office, um, maybe I'm being a bit idealistic, but you know, I'd really like to get in my car and from Tbilisi and drive through Abkhazia and attend the Sochi Games. Wouldn't that be great? Well, <laughs> that's also proved to be um, an illusion. Um, the, the Georgian uh, Olympic team will be going to Sochi, but there's going to be no um, politicians going. Um, they've they decided not to to boycott, which I think is probably the right decision. I, I, I think I saw an opinion poll saying that 66% of Georgians approve of the decision to go to the to the games. Only 17% oppose it. But it's clearly not going to be um, a kind of event of of great kind of coming together and, and, and reconciliation. Um, I think the Abkhaz also had ambitions for this game, that this would be a way that they could leverage these games to be put on the map. Um, we had, you know, that suddenly there would be, um, if not an Abkhaz delegation, that somehow they would be kind of inserted somehow into, into the 
games. And again, that hasn't happened. I think Putin's ambitions have really been scaled way down um, to the point where really the ambition is really to get through this game, these games unscathed and for people to be talking about skiing and skating rather, rather than terrorism, which is, um, frankly, I think what we all want to see. But, but clearly, the fact that we're here today talking, still talking about terrorism and security threats a week before the games shows um, where the reality is. So, and, and in that regard, um, I think Putin has shed some of his more ambitious goals for the Caucasus and just concentrated on Caucasus lockdown. So the Georgians um, are welcome to come, but there's no, this is not, not, not a time for rapprochement uh, with the Georgians other than the, the things that, that are already going on in Georgian-Russian relations to do with, with, with trade and, and maybe visa liberalization. Um, the Abkhaz have really been um, left out of the picture. Um, there's this huge security zone around Sochi and Abkhaz vehicles are no longer able to cross the border. Um, the rest of the North Caucasus um, vehicles are not allowed to come in, into Sochi. Um, and there's, no, there's now this 11 kilometer security zone um, south of the, um, of the Pso River, which divides Abkhazia from, from Krasnodarsky Krai, um, which is basically an extra security zone inside Abkhazia. Now, this has been portrayed in, was portrayed in the media rather inaccurately as, as a moving of the border. The Georgian foreign ministry uh, complained, which uh, naturally they would, but it, 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 this is not uh, any territory that Georgia has controlled for, for, for 20 years since Soviet times. And so this is just, uh, again, the Abkhaz are being restricted. I think um, an Abkhaz uh, friend who I, who I corresponded with, about this with said that we can we can make it across the border as pedestrians but we can't drive across so this you know this is we, we're not this is really um, going to be the lockdown games um, and I think again the objective clearly is is, is that there is no going to be no terrorist incidents within the greater Sochi area and that no uh, uh, spectators or athletes suffer and maybe they will pull that off but as Gordon has, has been saying that possibly increases the risk uh, of being in a different part of Russia uh, during the games. Uh, as for the Circassian issue, um, again, I think we have to be, um, I think this has been a bit overblown. Um, I think, again, the previous Georgian government tried to kind of instrumentalize the Circassians and passed a resolution in the Georgian parliament, as Sergei has written about, recognizing a Circassian genocide. Um, but I think that was treated with some skepticism by a lot of Circassians who didn't like the fact that they were being <laughs> used as part of a Georgian-Russian agenda. Circassians are many different ethnic groups, um, Kabardines, um, Adiks, um, and, and the ones who really s were from the Sochi area, they were the kind of indigenous people there way before the Russians arrived, the people like the Shapsugs and the Ubichs, people who really no longer there on the, on the ground, there may be a few thousand shapsaw, because I think Sergei had the figure about three or four thousand. Um, but most of those, if they're anywhere, their descendants are living in, in Turkey or in Jordan. And I think all they really wanted um, was, was just to be acknowledged that they existed, that, this, that they are the indigenous people from this area, and that um, by coincidence or other black coincidence, the 150th anniversary of, of their kind of massacre, defeat, and deportation in 1864 happened on this precise spot in Krasne Paliana where the gates, games were being held. So I think a little more sensitivity uh, from the Russian government would have gone a long way. Unfortunately, um, again, the Russian government and Mr. Putin are not famed for this kind of sensitivity towards ethnic minorities. Um, as, as Sergei reminds us, you know, they, in 2010, they sent the Kuban Cossack Choir to Vancouver Olympics, rather than, um, which was again sending out the wrong signal, given that the Cossacks associated with the, with the kind of destruction of the uh, native peoples rather than cooperating with them. Um, but I, I don't anticipate, I wouldn't anticipate any kind of um, effort by Circassians to disrupt the game. And, and if there is a a Kabardinian Jamaat and Viliat. This is these are Islamists. These are not these are not Circassian nationalists who have a nationalist agenda. Indeed, 
we've seen um, Islamists targeting um, people with a national agenda in places like Kabardina, Bulgaria, um, in, in, in the North Caucasus. Um, we've seen a couple of assassinations of academics who've been trying to kind of um, portray a non-Islamist identity for, for, for the Circassians. So, um, and just to finally, um, a few a few extra words um, about the North Caucasus. Well, actually, let me just also mention another reason um, that, that, that Abkhazia, I think, has become problematic, which is um, which is no one has mentioned, so so I should, which is that September the 9th, the Russian vice consul in Abkhazia was assassinated. Uh, the main suspect um, is a Chechen who was, I think. Um, wounded in Georgia, that, that's a whole different subplot. But again, that's a reason um, to, to, for the Russians to regard Abkhazia as a, as, a, as a problem and as a threat to these games rather than, than, than as an opportunity. Um, just a couple of words about North Caucasus. Um, um, I think Gordon and I would probably agree that we, that we have differences of perspective on, on the North Caucasus. So I'm sure you know, he obviously knows the detail of the uh, extremely well, um, but I, I'm, I'm a bit with Andy on, on the Umarov issue that I, I think Umarov um, was was a kind of leftover Chechen uh, warlord who didn't happen to be killed um, when um, basically the, the, the Chechen insurgency w was, was finally defeated in the early 2000s. Um, he successfully rebranded himself as a kind of Islamist leader. Um, but it's not clear to me when, when, and they have a very good website and very good branding. And in a sense, it's also in the Russian interest to, to kind of um, to, to um, pay attention to the Caucasus Emirate. But if, uh, to me, looking at it from a distance, uh, who doesn't study it day by day, it looks to me more like a, at best an umbrella organization in which, in which the individual operatives have a very loose if any association um, to Umarov, and I, I think you know, if you're a Dagestani um, Islamist, um, I, I think Umarov for you is a, is a bit of a leftover Chechen nationalist warlord who you don't feel much uh, affinity to. Um, but but we don't have a map here. But but we should should also remember that the, the North Caucasus is is very long. That the Dagestan, which is obviously the most volatile and dangerous part of it is a long, quite a long way from, from Sochi. Um, and that um, what happens in Dagestan really has no relationship to what happens in, in, in Sochi uh, itself. Um, what is happening in Dagestan, I think, is, uh, looks to be very unfortunate. It looks to be uh, Putin, um, you know, again, having a very tactical short-term response to the games. Um, lots of reports of, of rounding up, so rounding up of kind of marginal young men, the kind of young men who, you know, could be sitting at home doing nothing, or, or if they're rounded up and harassed and abused by the police, could be going over to the militants, and they, they're kind of in that grey zone. Uh, and and um, I think the new head of of, of Dagestan, Ramz, um, Ramzan Abdulatipov, was trying to kind of draw those people back in into the fold, and but. But because of the tactical response to the Sochi games, a lot of those people are now being rounded up, and that's making uh, the problem worse. So just to, just to sum up, this is not going to be, unfortunately, a, a moment of great Caucasus reconciliation between Georgians and Abkhaz and Russians and Cherkess. It's going to be, at best, a games um, where, where there's going to be heavy security presence, where you know there's going to be all these races are going to be done um, under, you know, with many Kalashnikovs um, being trained by Russian security personnel. And, and I think the best we can hope for is, is that we get through it without any major incident. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, for very thoughtful and uh, compre comprehensive uh, uh, perspective, bringing up sort of a broader, uh, broader look at the Caucasus and the, uh, the political and, and uh, and security challenges and, and threats. Regarding anniversaries, I would just uh, add that uh, the closing ceremonies, which will be held on February 23rd, will be the 70th anniversary um, <coughs> of the deport Stalin's deportation of the Chechens. I think it was 
and English. So it's another not particularly happy anniversary to take place during the games and the fact that it, it takes place on the, on the final day of the games. Well, I don't know who was planning the timing of that, but um, uh, let me uh, turn now to uh, uh, my uh, great colleague and, uh, and friend Juan Zarate uh, in many of the uh, things that I was negligent about in my uh, introduction this morning. Uh, is that uh, Juan is also the author of a recently published book uh, entitled Treasury's War, the Unleashing of a New Era of Financial Warfare. Juan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Andy. It's really a, an honor to be a part of this panel. Uh, the advantage of being last is I can ride the intellectual wake of the big brains to my right um, and also uh, commend to you the report and, and congratulate uh, Sergey and, and CSIS for uh, what is both a digestible compendium of very key analysis, but also a, a great source of just data points. If you look through the document, there's just, just great research and great revelations of, of some in interesting uh, points. What I thought I'd do is, as opposed to rehash uh, what the real experts have to say on this, is to give you a sense of, of how the U.S. may be perceiving this and is perceiving the threats in the game, from the games. Um, I had the advantage of being in the government um, during several Olympics and having the role at the White House, at least for the Turin Games uh, and then the, the Beijing Olympics uh, to coordinate uh, U.S. security and, and potential response to threats. And I think it's fair to say, not from an, an alarmist standpoint, but simply from an objective standpoint, given certainly everything we've heard and, and everything we know, that these are the most dangerous Olympic Games uh, since 9-11. Uh, given both the threat environment and given uh, all of the opportunities uh, that the various groups that Gordon laid out have in terms of this game. Um, let me lay out how the U.S. might view this and, and why um, I suggest it's the, sort of the most dangerous uh, context for uh, the Olympic Games since 9-11. Um, in the first instance, the U.S. views uh, the terrorist threat um, as as serious, and that's defined by uh, the intent of the groups uh, that could threaten the games, the capability uh, of those groups, and the opportunity. And I, let me go through that just simply and quickly, because that's often how the intelligence community and the policy community within the U.S. government thinks about and categorizes threats, uh, and certainly in this context makes very clear why it is that the U.S. is concerned uh, with, with the threats. First, you have the declared intent of groups to disrupt the Olympics. I mean, it's obvious, it's clear, it's come from the senior most leadership of uh, the various groups, the Caucasus Emirates in particular, uh, Umarov. Significantly, and I think important in the July uh, 2013 statement is not just the call for attacks on the games and a massive disruption, but also the lifting of the moratorium on attacks on civilian targets, which, uh, is in essence a call to arms and an opening of the target sets around the Sochi Olympics and not just the, the venues but also uh, the transportation hubs and, and other uh, venues that are potentially vulnerable and uh, the site of soft targets. In terms of capabilities, we've obviously seen you know, over the last uh, decade plus the ability of a variety of groups to hit uh, not just in the Caucasus but in the Russian heartland uh, with uh, not just efficiency but great devastation. Uh, we saw this in Volgograd, the three attacks uh, since the fall, um, and in particular with past attacks, and importantly in, in the description that Gordon gave and that's in, uh, certainly in the report, is that you have these groups that not only are motivated and have the intent but have practiced the capabilities and have um, mastered a variety of vectors to, to attack. That is to say, uh, these are groups that don't just specialize in one type of attack. These are groups that can plan a variety of ways to um, attack both secured sites and unsecured sites. You've seen this with singular suicide bombers. You've seen it with coordinated attacks. You've seen it with truck bombs and bus bombs. You've seen it with uh, the use of multiple uh, militants uh, in targeted assaults. Uh, and you've seen their willingness and ability over the course of uh, the last decade uh, to attack all 
uh, sorts of venues that are vulnerable. Uh, transportation hubs, of course, you've seen the metro attacks and the, uh, the rail line attacks. You've seen attacks on air lines. You've seen attacks on school security uh, sites, uh, police stations, hospitals. And so this is, these are groups uh, that, again, not only have the intent, but have the demonstrated capability to attack from a variety of vectors and are well practiced in many ways in, in how to do this. Finally, the opportunity. Obviously, as, as Jeffrey laid out, the Olympics is a, is a center stage, obviously, for world attention. You have the media there. You've got uh, all of the world watching. Uh, and hopefully, as Thomas said, watching for the right reasons, watching success on the slopes and on uh, the ice. But um, certainly, the terrorists understand um, not just the significance of the games, but the significance of the games to Russia and to Putin. And the personalization of the games itself, in some ways, presents a sort of a red flag for the bull, uh, an attractiveness for these groups to demonstrate their ability to actually attack and embarrass Putin and the Russians uh, in a very important way. And again, I take you back to the July 2013 statement from Doku Umarov, where he not only called for attacks on the Sochi games, not only lifted the moratorium on uh, attacking civilian targets, but also called for a new phase in the war for liberation of the Caucasus and the establishment of an Islamic Emirate. Uh, and what's interesting there, and perhaps most interesting to me from the point of view of an opportunity and the broader threat uh, from a variety of terrorist groups, not just from the Caucasus, but perhaps even from Central Asia, groups like IMU and IJU, or returning fighters from the Syrian conflict, um, or even foreign fighters that flow in, is the fact that this may be a moment of convergence of not just a rejuvenation of the fight and uh, an accelerated terrorist uh, campaign from some of these groups under the banner of the Caucasus Emirates, but also may be a rejuvenation of the global jihadi narrative around attacks against Russia as uh, the, ne the new near and far enemy in the, in the global jihadi narrative. And by that I mean uh, not only has Chechnya and Dagestan and Ingushetia always formed part of the global jihadi narrative, as seen most recently in Ayman al-Zawahiri's uh, statement where he makes reference to the uh, noble and heroic persistence of the fight in Chechnya. Uh, but the Russians in their support of Assad uh, and in the, the backing of uh, what is viewed by the global jihadi groups as uh, the backing of, of, of the slaughter of, uh, of Sunni Muslims um, has really put itself back into the heart of the global jihadi narrative as a, a key potential target and force to hit. And that may not manifest itself in Sochi, uh, but it certainly will manifest itself in the future. Um, and I think uh, that's an important point to note because I think in the minds likely of the, of the groups operating out of the caucuses, this is a, a a moment of opportunity to embarrass the Russians, but it also may be a moment of opportunity for the global jihadi narrative to take advantage of Sochi and take advantage of uh, what may be a, a moment of, of rejuvenation. Um, and lastly, the environs itself uh, present opportunities, and so it's not just uh, the potential to attack uh, in Sochi um, to launch you know, attacks or to uh, provide logistical support out of Abkhazia. The report, by the way, lays out uh, recent instances of terrorist um, caches captured in Abkhazia, explosive devices, weaponry, uh, supplies. Um, and so the environs itself provide opportunity logistically. Um, and most importantly, the perception of the risk and threat uh, to the games is most significant. That is to say, the terrorists need not necessarily attack successfully a venue in Sochi itself, uh, and the, the Russians are certainly applying brute force and security around the venues. Uh, but if they can create a sense of instability and insecurity by attacking in Volgograd, attacking in Moscow, attacking uh, in the near environs, it begins to change the perception of the games. It begins to start a debate, including in the U.S. government, no doubt, as to how to secure U.S. Uh, athletes, participants, uh, family members, sponsors, and um, citizens who are, who are visiting. Um, 
two other key points of concern for the U.S. government uh, that have, I think, accelerated over the last couple of weeks. One is a continued lack of visibility uh, into what the Russians are seeing and doing in terms of the, the actual terrorist threats or threads that they're following and the disruptions that are underway. There's no questions, question the Russians are following real threats. We've seen the reports of the Black Widows uh, that may have been overblown a bit, but it, it demonstrates that there's a, there are real concerns about particular terrorist operatives and threads. Um, and it's clear as well that the Russian forces have been engaged in counterterrorism and counterinsurgency operations, knocking down doors engaged in firefights, in particular in Dagestan, to try to be as disruptive as possible. Uh, and the death of Doku Umarov, or reported death, uh, may be a part of it. It's still unclear whether or not that's accurate, as Andy indicated. Uh, but the lack of visibility concerns the U.S. government because that, that um, creates a blind spot for the potential threats to U.S. interests uh, at the site. Uh, though I would say there's been nothing, at least publicly, that suggests that there are directed threats at the U.S. or U.S. athletes, but they are certainly part of the environment. And the concern over this, uh, you know, is manifested in, in uh, simple signals. You've seen, for example, the advisory f uh, for U.S. athletes not to wear identifying clothing outside of secured venues. Uh, that's a demonstration of concern that the U.S. government has that uh, there may be vulnerabilities. F finally, there is a concern about contingency planning. Uh, every country that goes through security planning around the Olympics wants to demonstrate not only that they can uh, put on a successful games, but they want to demonstrate that their security services are professional, that they can do it on their own terms, and that this is a, in many ways a point of nationalist pride. And so often you won't get as much cooperation or visibility as you want, regardless of the ally. Um, even in London, uh, it wasn't sort of complete and, uh, and open visibility. Every country sort of uh, manages uh, security at a, an event like this on their own terms. Uh, but I, I do think there is a, a, an important set of concerns about how the U.S. government might plan for worst-case scenarios. And, uh, for example, how one thinks about potential evac evacuation in the event of a, of, of a catastrophic attack or, or the worst-case scenario. Again, nothing to suggest that that's going to happen, but in security planning you have to plan for the worst. Um, and I would say, you know, bringing into this the U.S. political environment, uh, interestingly, in a post-Benghazi world, I think there's a question as to whether or not the U.S. government is perceiving the threat appropriately, pre-positioning assets uh, the right way, and planning for, again, worst-case scenario, which has been much of the criticism in the post-Benghazi uh, review. Um, and so that's, that's a way of thinking about U.S. concerns. Um, and let me not belabor this, but let me just reference sort of three uh, broader points that I think are important to note. One is a, a matter of scheduling, uh, and Gordon, this may be helpful to you and your publisher, but keep in mind that we have not just the uh, Olympic Games in February, but we have the Paralympic Games in March. And so we've got a two-month window here of uh, major visibility and potential vulnerability in Sochi, um, where I would say, you know, it, the terrorist groups likely don't mind too much if uh, their attack planning moves into March and they're able to effectuate uh, a rather significant attack that still embarrasses Putin. It may not be when uh, you know, NBC, M NBC is, uh, is, has 24-7 coverage, but the coverage of Paralympic uh, Games is, is quite widespread. You remember how successful that was in the London context, how popular it was, and so you can imagine Again, the terrorists, perhaps if they don't have an opening or opportunity uh, that's ripe in February, thinking that uh, the, the opportunities might arise in March. And so keep in mind this is a, a longer window uh, than one would imagine. Second, this is actually a, a moment of great opportunity of cooperation between the U.S. and Russia. Um, it's always a moment of potential cooperation uh, around multinational security events where information sharing, cooperation can be enhanced. And you've seen this from the U.S. government trying to push this with the offering of more FBI agents and security personnel from state diplomatic security on the ground, the offering of new technology from Department of Defense, offer of 
more coordination in terms of planning on the ground. Um, it's not clear to me that the Russians are taking full advantage of this, and they aren't, uh, but it is an important note that this is a moment of opportunity in the relationship between the U.S. and Russia because there's a coincidence of interest, which is having a safe, successful games and ensuring the terrorists uh, don't uh, succeed in, in disrupting them. Um, finally, just to reiterate the point, uh, and it's an unfortunate reality, that the perception of insecurity in many ways does um, perhaps not just as much damage materially, but psychologically to the games. To the extent that this is the game, games that's perceived to be locked down because of security, uh, or uh, where any time a terrorist group says boo and the Russians run, or the US security officials have to respond, that unfortunately is a success for these groups. And again, keeping in mind that Sochi may not be the end of the story for these groups, in many ways for the groups in the Caucasus and the global jihadi uh, networks, this may be the beginning of a new chapter. Um, and so viewing it that way, I think, is a, a way of viewing the threat differently um, and explains why I said at the start, uh, this may be the most dangerous of Olympic games we've seen post 9-11. Thank you, Andy. Thanks, Juan. That was a, a terrific, uh, terrifically insightful uh, present presentation. Um, I'd like to make a couple of comments, one that uh, sort of builds directly on points you made, and, and particularly the last one. Uh, to me, uh, this Sochi Games, looking at the protagonists, the terrorist groups, Russia-based, not only Russia-based though, as Juan intimated, and Vladimir Putin. It, it brings to mind to me, the, uh, as I mentioned in a press conference a couple of weeks ago here, the image of, you know, in the American narrative, high noon at the OK Corral. Or in the Russian narrative, it is sort of the ultimate kto uh, For the terrorists, I would suggest this target, and not necessarily in Sochi itself, but throughout the Russian Federation, uh, the efforts to spoil the game somehow, and this is a holy grail. This is the holy grail of, of, juicy, of juicy targets, uh, certainly for the Russia-based terrorist groups. And just to amplify on, on uh, the very insightful remarks Jeff made, for Vladimir Putin, his political career he emerged virtually from nowhere when he was named prime minister in 1999. His political career as a national political figure in Russia skyrocketed on the perceived success uh, in the beginning of the second Chechen war after uh, the Chechens uh, had made the incursion into Dagestan in the fall of 19, 1999. Putin has said on many occasions that he sees himself actually having a special role, I mean, a, almost there's kind of a messianic role for him to stabilize the North Caucasus and the significance of stabilizing the North Caucasus. So while all the world's attention is on, on, this, on this region, uh, anything that would, con would uh, further mm, tarnish that narrative of his, I think, is, uh, is very significant. And there, I would, I think the, the point that, that Gordon was making that, you know, this could be a very significant inflection point uh, for, for Mr. Putin himself, uh, he, because he has so much riding on the, uh, the success of these, of, these, of these games. One point, and this is really, since actually at CSIS, we do believe in appropriately referencing the source of, of, uh, of insight. That's a point I want to, uh, uh, make that Jeff, Jeff made a couple of weeks ago at our press conference that, well, okay, we know that these are the lockdown games. Vladimir Putin has guaranteed the security of these games. Of course, you know, nobody can guarantee the security of, of anything uh, in reality, but the, uh, I think the, the real point is, is that any security system is only as strong as its weakest link. And in this case, uh, the deep corruption 
of Russia, including security forces, police, and others, is a real problem. It's been a real problem that's facilitated successful terrorist attacks in the past uh, and possibly uh, successful terrorist acts in the, in the future. Um, finally, <clears throat> I got a, an inquiry from Foreign Affairs uh, early in the week. Well, is there something that hasn't really been covered about the Sochi Games? <laughs> and it led me to think. Gosh, so with all the trees that have been felled, with all of the commentary about the Sochi Games, um, the, my question was, okay, this is my title, you can't use it. What if you held an Olympics and nobody came? Um, you know, Jeff mentioned the attendance, the attendance uh, issue. We referenced there are 70,000, or 70% 70 of the, uh, the tickets have, have been sold, which of course may or may not be, may or may not be true. Uh, whatever amount of tickets have actually been sold, are those tickets really going to be used? Um, obviously, the, the interest of the international community uh, in attending the games has been dramatically reduced. I think there are very, very serious reservations on the, parts, on the part of many Russian, Russian citizens themselves. Um, now, when I raised this in our, uh, in our session with, uh, well, this mysterious opposition figure that Jeff referenced before was Vladimir Milov, who spoke here on Monday. Uh, Jeff said, look, Andy, that's not going to be a problem because, you know, look, Russian authorities are very effective in busing people in to attend pro-government rallies or busing people around at elections to vote Chicago style, i.e. many times, and the, and the like. Nevertheless, though, um, I, think there, I think there should be some concern about it would look rather embarrassing uh, if, you know, international cameras are on the, uh, the stands and it, it doesn't appear that, uh, that, that the, the attendance is, a, is really a problem. Um, and just tied to that, you know, let's not forget the possibility of, well, you know, people of course talked about, let's say, that the LGBT community making some kind of demonstration or, or there are a whole, a whole set of possible actors who would have uh, reasons for making some kind of, using the podium of the games if they could to make some kind of uh, demonstration uh, in some way, shape, or form. But the one that struck me was, I was recalling, you know, the, the ultimate fighting uh, um, competition that was held at uh, Olympic uh, Stadium indoors, large venue in Moscow a few years ago, a couple of years ago, and where uh, Putin, it was actually, you know, where a Russian, the Russian guy defeated the American, so that was, that was good. And uh, so Mr. Putin decided to kind of use that to uh, make some public remarks uh, to the, uh, the crowd of uh, uh, thousands. And he was booed and hissed. Booed and hissed. Um, very, very embarrassing. So something of that nature could, uh, uh, could transpire also. Um, like all my colleagues, of course, uh, we all hope that none of the, the threats uh, and challenges that we have, uh, we've outlined here in our opening remarks um, will come to transpire, uh, but uh, uh, I will be watching these games with a special interest. And let me also, again, uh, I want to acknowledge Sergei Markadona for the, the work he's done on this, this report. I'm very, very sorry that he's not able to be here with us with us today. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank the, uh, the Carnegie Corporation of New York, which uh, supported the visiting uh, fellowship of uh, uh, Sergei here and also uh, the publication of the report. So um, uh, let me uh, now open the floor to questions and comments. Uh, and if I may, I would like to uh, turn to uh, an old friend uh, here who's arrived in Washington uh, in late summer of uh, last year, that is the uh, esteemed uh, ambassador to Georgia, uh, Archil Gagashidze. And for those of you others, that after uh, Ambassador Gagashidze, uh, please uh, uh, identify yourselves briefly for the uh, for us. Thank you, Andy. Uh, thank you, distinguished panel. Uh, Georgia has its very unique angle. Uh, of uh, perspective on, on Russia generally and the, on the Sochi Olympics. Um, as the new government, uh, uh, which 
uh, came to power just a mm, month ago, it decided to review its policy towards uh, Russia in you know, order to slightly improve its relationship uh, with Russia to mitigate the risk of resumption what has happened back in 2008. Um, among others decided to uh, change the policies of the old government and, uh, and to join the games, not to boycott them. So Georgian delegation will be going there, very small but still. Uh, mm, uh, well, uh, and more so, Georgian government offered uh, Russian government uh, cooperation uh, on, on security. So far, we have not received any response from Russians, but nonetheless, uh, we indicated, signaled them that uh, we are in favor of peaceful conduct, uh, conduct of the games. Because uh, if anything bad happens there, it's, it's in, it is in nobody's interest, I mean, except for those who will be doing that. Uh, especially for Georgia, who is uh, the closest uh, foreign country, uh, which uh, neighbors the site, Im immediately neighbors the site uh, of the Olymp Olympic Games. And uh, as we all know, the uh, Russians, uh, especially the ineffective government, who fails to prevent from uh, uh, happening uh, mm, these undesirable uh, things, uh, may pinpoint at others and uh, try to find scapegoats elsewhere. elsewhere. And uh, sometimes, uh, in many times, uh, Russia would do, s uh, do uh, by doing so, would uh, mm, uh, point at Georgia. So it's uh, in Georgia's interest that these, ta uh, these games go peacefully. Uh, and uh, I, would, uh, uh, I would agree with uh, uh, Andrew, as I'm of the same age as Andrew is, that uh, on my mind too, uh, I, I, I don't remember uh, m any Olympic Games uh, m being the summer games or winter games uh, when we would not uh, talk in advance of those games uh, which of the nation national teams would get how many medals. This time we, uh, we talk about whether or not these games will be peaceful. So this is the first ever instance when we are very much concerned about the uh, safety of the games. Uh, and uh, as I gather from this panel, uh, the, uh, the, mm, um, the possibility of uh, terrorist attack is, uh, is there and, uh, uh, and quite likely. Uh, so uh, my uh, uh, question would be to the panel that uh, in case uh, anything of this kind uh, happens uh, in Russia, then what this would mean uh, mm, for Putin, for the reputation of Russia n as a uh, as a, a safe uh, uh, place to hold these kind of events, because down the road we have also G20 in, in June, and in four years' time we have we have soccer World Cup uh, games uh, in, in Russia, and and uh, uh, what this uh, uh, what what kind of implication so these kind of uh, uh, events? undesirable events may, may have uh, for Russia's reputation in this sense. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Let me also uh, express my, uh, my hope that uh, Georgia brings home some gold, okay? Um, uh, let me also note that uh, we are over time already because of my pathetic uh, efforts to moderate and, uh, and, showing, up and showing up late. Uh, the panel is prepared to be here until 1045, and uh, uh, obviously you are not being held hostage. Um, uh, let me turn uh, uh, for this to, uh, to Jeff and to Juan, perhaps, uh, to make a brief, uh, brief comment to uh, the Ambassador's question. Okay. In, in the point that the Ambassador made about the focus of these Olympics being on the security rather than on the medal count, I think, is, is right, and it's quite, quite striking. Um, there have been, of course, terrorist attacks at Olympic Games in the past. In Munich in 1972, most notably and then in Atlanta in 1996. What was different about those attacks, though, was that in the aftermath of them, nobody used them to call into question the legitimacy of the political system of the country that were holding the Olympics. Um, because so much of the Russian government's and Putin's personal prestige is tied up in these Olympics, I think if there is a successful terrorist attack, it has a, it sends a very negative signal internationally and also within the country, and it can have, I think, long-running um, political fallout. Uh, you mentioned also the, the G20 and, and the World Cup, and there, you know, I think regardless of whether there's a successful attack at the Olympics or not, the complications that we've already seen in the run-ups to the Games, <clears throat> I'm sure, is creating a lot of heartburn in the headquarters of FIFA uh, when they think about having to do an event that's even larger than the Olympics spread across the entire country. If you have security challenges 
with regard to a single venue, imagine that now multiplied by multiple times across the country for all the different places you're going to be holding um, the World Cup. So I think it's, it's going to be a problem that we're going to see come up again and again and again as Russia continues to hold these international events in the years to come. Mr. Ambassador, I can be very quick in responding. I think it would in some ways depend on the, the nature of the event, of course, and so the scope of it would, would matter. And I think also the reaction and how the, the Russians responded, um, whether or not that was viewed as competent, uh, effective, uh, and helpful. Because I think it's, uh, as, as Jeffrey said, you know, Atlanta happened, uh, but there wasn't a sense that the games had to collapse or that there was a sense that uh, the U.S. wasn't a, an appropriate venue for future major international events. Um, I think the question is, would, a, would an attack be of a, of a type, a scope, and reveal vulnerabilities that really do call into material question Russia's ability to host these kinds of significant events? And I think, um, you know, again, we're, we're all hoping and praying that things go very well, uh, but if something were to happen, I think that debate would happen immediately. Hi, my name is Tara McAlvey. I'm with the BBC, and I'm wondering if you can tell me what you think is the most serious threat, the number one threat, and also um, what the U.S. is doing about it. Uh, in terms of likelihood, probably suicide bombings, but I wouldn't, <clears throat> I wouldn't ignore the, the threat to uh, undertake a chemical attack. Uh, that could have been psychological terror. That may have been the purpose of it. Uh, on the other hand, who knows? With respect to the U.S., what they do, U.S. intelligence community law enforcement tried to understand uh, any particular threats, other than the broad threat environment, which they understand well, but any particular threats. That's why the question of visibility into what the Russians know and are following becomes so important. Um, they're trying to offer any and all cooperation to the Russians. Uh, and then the U.S. is uh, preparing contingency plans. Um, and so that's, that's what you do in an environment like this. But uh, at the end of the day, you in many ways are beholden on the host government's willingness to cooperate uh, and their effectiveness in preparing for the event and any eventuality. Thanks. Just a, a brief comment, because I want to highlight the, 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 the Syria as, as, aspect of this, and particularly with the, the chemi chemical weapons issue. Um, as <clears throat> Gordon uh, uh, has, has, has talked about, the, uh, if you go back to uh, Assad's decision to give up his chemical weapons, which undoubtedly in my mind, uh, he was basically given an ultimatum by, by Mr. Putin and the Russians that either you do this or, or we will no longer be able to, to support you in any way, sh way, shape, way, shape or form. We can talk about that more. I think the, the real issue there is the question to which actually uh, Assad and, and, uh, and Syrian forces actually were, able to, are able, were and are able to control, have effective control over their chemical weapons arsenal, which was dispersed in 40 plus places around, around, around the country. Uh, that has worried me for a long time. Let's go to this side of the, uh, yes. Hi, uh, Alicia Saratani with EIR Magazine. Um, right after the Volgograd bombings at the end of December, the Russian Foreign Ministry issued a statement that said that these attacks were very much like what's happened in the United States, in Libya, in Syria, and that they even went as far as to say that all these attacks are coming from the same quarters, um, effectively saying, you know, this is a th these are this is a global issue. This isn't, didn't just happen in Volgograd. And I think in that light, um, what better way to force the issue of global terrorism than hosting the Olympics in a, in, a, in a place close to Chechnya, close to Georgia, close to these different conflicts. Um, so I think it's very interesting that they're being held there. Um, but my question is uh, to further underscore the, the, the issue of global terrorism, not just the attacks on Sochi. Um, if you remember, in the summer, at the height of the Syrian crisis, Prince Bandar from Saudi Arabia had a meeting with Putin and said that if you don't back off your support for Assad, we can't guarantee that the Chechen rebels will um, not attack Sochi. And he said very clearly, we finance them. So for the United States to uh, have all this discussion about security and the corruption of Putin 
Um, for the United States to continue to call Saudi Arabia an ally of ours, I think it's just a little bit hypocritical. So I'm, my question is, well, no, no, my, my direct question is, how do we raise the level of collaboration between the United States and Russia and actually have a discussion about s the Saudis and other foreign sponsors of terrorism? Um, because if something happens in Sochi, that's not Russia's problem, that's our problem as well. Thanks. Yeah, well, I, I will like it. Uh, well, I don't, I, I'm not sure that the, the Saudi Arabian foreign minister actually said that. There's no stenogram of that meeting as far as I know. So I have my doubts. I think that was put out by an Iranian source. Uh, the, other, the other thing that's important to keep in mind, I think, is when discussing the North Caucasus is, is uh, you can pretty much uh, leave out the word Chechnya. This is now a North Caucasus-wide operation. Um, and uh, the Dagestanis are leading the, uh, the charge for the last, since spring uh, 2010. Uh, that doesn't mean that Umarov is, is uh, irrelevant. I, I somewhat disagree with what Tom said earlier, but we don't have time probably to go into that. Um, the third point is the, the Caucasus Emirate is part of a global jihadi revolutionary movement. It's an ally. So it's not an affiliate of Al-Qaeda, uh, but that doesn't mean it doesn't share its uh, goals and ideology. Um, uh, and that's, that's, I'll just leave it there. Well, it's certainly a strategic opportunity for Russia to reinforce its message with respect to what's happening in Syria. So there's no question that that's, that's a potential here. And I think in some ways, as I said earlier, I think it is a moment of potential cooperation between the U.S. and Russia, whether it's on, you know, who's, who's fueling this, what's behind it, et cetera. But there is, there is narrative, ideological, and to a certain extent, um, c connectivity between what happens in the Caucasus and what happens in Syria, particularly because that's how the groups view it. Um, and that's why I said, for me, this is an interesting moment of uh, understanding Sochi, what, what's happening in the Caucasus with what's happening in Syria, because as I've argued in other venues, Syria in many ways becomes the locus of the potential resurrection of a new Al-Qaeda-driven movement from the Sunni violent extremist perspective. Doesn't mean that Assad should stay. Uh, I, I've argued that means that we've got two policy goals in Syria, not just one. Uh, just two quick comments on, on, on this. One, uh, let's remember the, the Boston Marathon bombing, the Sarnayev, the Sarnayev brothers. Okay, obviously this was a, an intelligence failure on the part of security failure on the part of the United States. It took place on the United States, United States territory, but also highlighted two things. Uh, one, it was also a failure in U.S.-Russian uh, collaboration security cooperation. Uh, three, I think it, uh, it um, emphasized to the United States intelligence community and security community uh, the importance of tracking more closely the Northern Caucasus uh, as, a, as a seedbed for, uh, for global, global terrorism. Um, <clears throat> okay, next question, comment. We have uh, we're running low on time. Yeah, you had your hand up earlier, yes. Sir. Yes, thank you. My name is uh, Jim Felkamp, and I'm a professor at uh, George Mason and George Washington on terrorism. And the question I have, you kind of stole my thunder about Operation Lentil. And uh, it's also Patriot's Day, which was when the ma marathon bombing was for us, too. Um, but with all this talk concerning the, you know, terrorist attacks and potential terrorist attacks and the uh, uh, email that was sent out to the couple of the IOC committees, to Germany and a few, saying that and they turned out to be false, but by raising the, the threat of a terrorist attack, have it the terrorists pretty much already won by suppressing the uh, attendance or the popularity of these Olympics. And the question I have is, at what threshold does Putin really lose all international prestige because of this? He put his you know, name on this Olympics. And how does that translate internationally to his prestige and his credibility when it comes to some of these other events and his negotiating power vis-a-vis -vis the United States, like with Snowden or with the Chinese or whatever in the international realm? Thank you. Uh, great question. The other point I want to make to the previous question was it, there hasn't been more. We have wanted, the United States has wanted the Quad to work more with the Russians on the Sochi Olympics, but the Russians have not been very enthusiastic about it. That's... That's an issue out there. Okay, uh, where is the red line for, for Mr. Putin? Jeff? 
you know, I don't know. I don't think we can say, you know, if X, then Y. I'm not sure there's a clearly linear relationship that way. Uh, obviously, we're going to have to wait and see what happens. You know, the games could surpass all of our expectations. They could go off without any terrorist attacks occurring. The Russian teams could actually do very well. And I, I, I want to emphasize this again. I think it, because so much of the audience that Putin is focusing on is domestic, actually the performance of the Russian athletes is going to matter in terms of how they're perceived and in terms of the narrative that Putin is trying to get across with his own constituency. Um, from an international perspective, I don't know, you know, I mean, I'd be curious to hear Juan's thoughts on this, but it's, you know, I think we already know um, that this is a, a problem for Russia and that there hasn't been as much cooperation as I think we would have liked um, on the counterterrorism issue, but that there are still all of these other areas, you know, whether it's Syria or Iran or China or anything else, where we're kind of condemned to work together. And I think that's not going to change regardless of what does or doesn't happen at the Olympics. Jeff McCausland. Oh, thank you. I'm a Jeff McCausland. I'm a professor at Dickinson College. This may be a very easy but sad question, and that is based on the global showcase, which is the Olympics, based on the personification of the Olympics under Putin, as this panel is so well described, does any panelist possibly imagine that some terrorist group would not make an attempt? Now, that attempt could be thwarted in its early stages, but can anybody possibly imagine they would ignore this opportunity? Um, they, they haven't ignored the opportunity and they'll take advantage. I think the one thing to keep in mind with uh, these types of groups is they will take advantage of the opportunities, but they will strike when they're ready. Um, and so they've been thinking about this for a while and they may be ready. And this is why I raised the, the March window, because it may not be that it comes the second week of February. It may be down the road. And consider these, and consider these concluding remarks, please. Thanks. Um, yeah, I absolutely concur with that. There, there's going to be, they're going to take the opportunity, and unfortunately, it could be against a very soft target, you know, hundreds or thousands of miles uh, uh, from Sochi. I think I'll just stop now. Mm -hmm. I, uh, there's no way they're going to ignore it. Uh, to the previous question, uh, and, and I think they're already tr trying to uh, undertake attacks uh, that's ongoing. Uh, again, it, the timing may be different, as uh, as uh, Juan said. Um, uh, on the previous question, they're going for something bigger. Attendance, you know, unless the stadiums are completely empty, then they could say, okay, that's a victory. But they're going for something bigger. I think the Caucasus Emirate would very much like, uh, Umarov and the Dagestanis especially, would very much like to give us a big bang, so to speak, uh, not to use a sad pun. Um, but um, I think that's what they're going for. Yeah, I would just agree with all of the, the previous commentators. This is a golden opportunity for the insurgents to make a point the global media as well as everybody in Russia is focusing on what happens in Sochi. They've already made attempts both successful and unsuccessful and I would be completely, sh and, I mean they are continuing to make these preparations so yes I think the, those attempts will continue. And my answer is yes of course but let me uh, caveat that or, or conclude by saying that uh, we have emphasized what Mr. Putin has writing on these uh, writing on these games, more in a negative sense if something happens. But if there is not a, a successful terrorist terrorist attack in some way, shape, or form, uh, even though there's already been significant uh, you know kind of disturbance around the games because of what's happened and what's what's been said, then this will be looked at, I think, as as uh, some kind of uh, a defeat actually for the uh, uh, for those that have announced that uh, these games are are a target. Having said that, that threat is not going to go away anytime soon because unfortunately uh, the, the, the sources that are generating uh, those that are inspired to make these kinds of attacks uh, is, uh, is not going away anytime soon either. So with that, let me uh, really uh, thank um, Juan, Tom, Gordon, and Jeff for a terrific panel. Uh, let me thank you for attending for your ex their ex excellent questions. 
and uh, may we all not have a lot of may we not have reason to have a press conference or a meeting at CSIS during or after the games where we're talking about security threats. Thanks very much.